Now, good morning. We hope you're keeping very well this morning. As I said, a big, dirty rain cloud coming in over Wales this morning. So we're going to get some of it this afternoon. We don't know how bad it's going to be, but uh, up until lunchtime, it is considered around Waterford, Wexford, fairly dry. I know there's the odd shower out there at the minute. We'll see how it goes. Uh, And be very careful if you are out later on, if there's very heavy thunderstorms, because we've seen some pictures of cows being killed. I got some pictures of... um, uh, an electric gate in Wexford annihilated, taken down, taken apart, blown up by uh, the electric storm there the other night. And um, just be very careful if, if there are thunderstorms out and about. We don't want any deaths. Uh, speaking of deaths, we have the horrendous situation, the shooting of a detective Garda in County Roscommon. Colm Harkin has been named officially, as you heard on the news day, uh, there by the Garda press office. It's understood the shooting took place near the Garda station man has been arrested and he was the 89th member of Angarda Siakana killed in the line of duty. He joined the force in 1995 and a very experienced officer survived by his father, sister and three brothers. Um, 88th guard to be killed. Um, just confirming that. I'm going to talk now to Tosh Lavery. Tosh has, uh, is very well known, his family very well known around Waterford and Tosh is very well known as a guard, a former guard within the, the force and has been involved in many diving incidents and the underwater units, but also involved in many, many uh, investigations with Gardaí over the years. Uh, Tosh Lavery, good morning. How are you? I'm good, oh, thanks. I'm good. Morning. For any guard or any former guard to wake up and hear this news this morning, um, it must really just go to the, the heart of it, does it? Well, to be honest with you, I turned on the news and I, I mean, I heard it. Um, I, I nearly choked, to be honest with you. I had two lads in the guards and uh, they are getting in kind of getting to call something, like, you know what I mean? And then I just had a quick look there and this castle ray and the two lads were shot down 81. It's funny, there's a four in my book, like a four of us at the scene uh, of that shooting uh, where three bank robbers killed the two boys, you know, and two of them were convicted and three of them were convicted, but one of them got off after many years. One of them was Sam Harvard, one of the three men that was involved in the killing of the two guards in. Yeah. They were in the bank raid on him in Casaray. It was a crash out the country, out in a place called Loughlin, and then um, the cab patrol car crashed into the getaway car and uh, they got out and they shot two of the guards out of three. Uh, John Morley and Henry Bourne, I joined with Henry Bourne. And then we were called over and we were over there for two or three weeks to help me with the search scene and following those they were on the run for a few days and through the trees and this time and the other. But that was sad then and then Paddy Morsey was my sergeant in the diving unit. Just after he left the unit he went to Colin and he was shot by then. Just to go back to the Castle Ree one before uh, others, yeah. uh, Tosh. Um, I remember it. I remember... Um, the severity of it and I was only a 11 year old boy but I remember that the shock that reverberated around the country with it it's hard to believe it's 40 years ago now 40 like it's just it's just the, the commemoration of the 40 years and 1981 as you say and for the uh, for for this poor man to be shot now as well in in the same town the same village effectively um, so, so it, 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 it's really unreal because when I saw Calgary I could not believe I could not believe in the same town and the two lads that were shot were from the same town. They were from Mayo. Both of them were from the same place, even though John Morley got more of a advertisement because he was playing for Mayo and he was a Gaelic football detective. But it, the thing about this now for me really is I've been out there uh, out on the bike with the lads and they walk and that. And the one thing I've been saying, you know, about what's going on in America and uh, this fella took the taser off a policeman and this and the other. And I just said to you, when we were training with the guns and that, like the one thing you were taught is not to let anyone take it off yet. Now, you mind that part because <laughs> you're out in America at the moment and you look at social media and everything, it's, it's frightening, you know, and it's kind of, I never kind of give an up look on that because when I saw that situation and my mum was shot, you know what, this guy, you know, what are you going to do? If he got his gun off him instead of the taser, he'd have shot him. And it, that is one thing you're always taught, you know, and it's the fear. Like this man, uh, what I read there a little bit, just that he was walking the street there in Casare and he met, he, he accosted some man or some man, I don't know, and the man got what the going off in the shop. And if he to shoot that man on the street, it would be a different story this morning. I can guarantee you that. And we'd be all in uproar and they'd be talking about what's happening in America. 
and you get, you're in a no-win situation. But the sad thing for me as well is that telling you, you know, you, the way society is going, um, now I know we've had a quiet time during the COVID and that, but people can't wait to get back out, you know, and the madness factor. Thankfully, there haven't been too many guards shot over the, the decades, but... And when it does happen, yeah. it's 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 horrendous. Every every time a guard goes out, you're you're aware that you're uh, you're going into a situation that you, you just don't know what's going to happen on any given day. Well, that's a fact, you see, and that's why any person, uh, a man next door to me, there's son in the guard too, and any person uh, that was in the guards now, it's 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 hard for an ex guard to have sons in the guard because you know what the stories in there written a car pulling up outside your door at night, you know, at three or four in the morning, you get any of them knocks at the door. That is a fact of life. Whereas a person, say a farmer or somebody so enjoying the guards, he, he does not know what goes on the car. And you're going to be looking at the situation as it's gathering momentum, you know, out there. And it, it would be in fear. And some of the plain, plain clothes lads are out there with no guns, you know, and uh, I'm up here in Dublin now and I live in Blanche and it was in the king was on about the cadist he can land. There is a lot of guns around and there's a lot of drugs that are taking over the country. And, you know, you are worried. Like, I mean, have no doubt in your mind and I'm sure there's guards and cars. And I don't believe any guard in plain clothes should be not be armed because the criminal thinks he's armed. So this thing of having fellas going out of plain clothes and uh, looking at him here up here uh, with no guns, uh, to be honest with you, I find the the other guy, the other way of the ranch and way of this, that, and the other the, the, the detectives with guns, and there's other lads out there with none. Uh, you're assumed to have, and it's a fear. Now, now look, it's not going to be an, an academic year or sorry, a pandemic, you know, whatever you want to call it, but it's really, really sad. And to be no funeral to the extent of the other funerals, and you know, the family might be happy, I don't know, but uh, there's always stay funerals on guard. And yeah, that's right, whatever yeah. Whatever happened here, yeah, for a fella to take a gun off of him and to wear shots into him, look, there's something not right here. And uh, I hope to God, you know, it's, it's, you know, some some excuse, I don't know, but that a fella yeah. wouldn't think that because what we're seeing in social media and that, that we could do this with our police force. Our, our police force, I want to say this, have been absolutely fantastic. And the one good thing for me from COVID, it has shown the guards in another light. We're always looking. When we were kids on the road playing ball, the guards were the enemy sergeant police on the bike. <laughs> and you know what I mean? Playing ball, getting over the wall into the orchard. That's what it was. But now, what we've seen the guards performing during the COVID and the nice things they're doing, and they're showing this on television and that. Because... All we ever see is this kid is tricked and this, that, and the other. We should show the guards in another life. I think the public are starting to get there. We have a great name now, you know what I mean? The type of police force we have. And I wouldn't like it to, even with this now, I don't think there's going to be any, you know, hatred from, from within. And, um, you know, but there'll be a lot of sadness. There will. And our, th- our thoughts, his name has just been uh, released. Uh, it's Garda Colum Horkin. So uh, our thoughts go out to his family and uh, his colleagues. Tosh, you mind yourself and all your family and uh, hope everybody stays safe, yep. OK? Thanks very much, Damien. Thanks Th- for the call. Thanks very much, Tosh. Uh, Text coming in 083 975. My deepest sympathy to the Garda and to the Garda's family from Kit and a few callers as well. 051 846 123. Audrey is there waiting for a call. Uh, I'm joined in studio by Jason Murphy, councillor, um, and we're going to be on the line now talking to some Fianna Fáil members about the, the future for the soldiers of destiny. It, it puts everything into context, Jason, doesn't it? It certainly does. I mean, um, we sit here and we talk about politics and Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day, um, when you see what happened there uh, yesterday. So um, it does put everything into context. Does, and, yeah. And, and, uh, yeah. Now, politics is important because is obviously important. political yeah. uh, ways of, of, of justice and systems and all that are, are yeah. important. So it, there's, there's, there's ways of doing things. I know, I know what you mean and you're putting it into context mm. very well. Um, stay with us. We're going to be talking about uh, the future for the soldiers of destiny. Um, I wonder how we describe it. Is it a little family row, Jason, or is it just a bit of? Uh, I think it's 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 a productive uh, family discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Now, so sorry to hear about the Garda shooting last night. We're so lucky to have an unarmed force with many good people in it. 
many of us had a bad experiences uh, in different aspects of life. We have respect and support for them. And that's from another texter. Now, for the next few minutes, we're going to be talking about Fianna Fáil. Now, some people might think that this mightn't matter. This mightn't concern them. But... Um, As we were just saying with Jason there, it's like a a row within the royal family, you know. It is interesting. Even if you're outside and you've no interest in it, to talk about the future of Fianna Fáil is effectively to talk about the future of Ireland. Because Fianna Fáil has been the most successful political party, one of the most successful political parties in Western Europe in the last 70 years. Jason, you're doing a big sigh. I am. I am. And on the line, we have Ollie Wilkinson, former TD in Waterford. Good morning, Ollie. Good morning, Damien. And we also have John O'Leary. Good morning, John. Good morning, Damien. John is chair of the Fianna Fáil party in Waterford, a councillor. And also we're trying to get Anna Cowman on the line. So we're going to have two people, effectively, John O'Leary and Jason Murphy, who are in favour of the voting yes in the programme for government. Ali will give his view about this in a minute and also we will talk to Anna Kalman. So it's a case of just talking to a number of different people and trying to tease this out. And we're not going to talk about the programme for government per se, the ins and outs of that. I want to know and our listeners want to know about the internal machinations of Fianna Fáil and how this is playing out. I'm going to start with Jason Murphy. Jason, can I ask you briefly, please, can you understand the depth of feeling and animosity that some people still feel for Fine Gael and how it hurts for the parliamentary party and for Micheál Martin and others to say this is a deal we have to go with. Damien, I suppose we've had a lot of conversations around this. I understand this more than most. If, if you come into my front room in Larchville, behind me is a picture, 1932 Bodenstown, of my great-grandfather in Bodenstown six years after the foundation of Fianna Fáil, up there in County Kildare um, at Bodenstown. So this pains me an awful lot. I've rolled this around in my mind and I have to say, eight weeks ago, I probably would have voted against this. But, but we're, we're in a changed reality now. Um, COVID-19 has changed everything. I mean, if you, looked where, if you look where we came from back in February... We had a functioning economy, a strong economy, and we'll have to give the present government a certain amount of credit for that. We're now staring at a bar of 26% unemployment. The RSI are saying we're going to be heading into the biggest recession in the history of the state that will leave the 30s and 40s and the 80s and what we suffered after 2011 in the shade. It's a time now for radical thinking. It's a time for different thinking. It's a time for novel thinking. And it's probably a time to... Maybe bury the hatchet after the Civil War. OK, you're a councillor in Waterford. Yeah. I'm going to go straight to Ollie Wilkinson, former TD. Ollie Wilkinson, it's a time to bury the hatchet. It's a time to basically go in with Fine Gael because of the current economic and health situation. What do you have to say to that? Well, I wouldn't agree with that. I think, though, that Jason summed up things fairly well no. there when he outlined where we are at this point in time. And I would certainly fear for the future of Fianna Fáil now. He is quite right when he says it's time for radical thinking. And I think that the people in the last election gave their verdict on Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael together. They had been there for the past four years. And the verdict was given and it wasn't um, complimentary. And Sinn Féin got... Uh, as many votes with half the candidates as either of the two parties. I think Fianna Fáil should have talked to Sinn Féin. I think it is very, very important to bring them in from the cold and to get them involved in the serious business of running the country. There is absolutely no doubt that Ireland uh, as Jason has outlined the, the, the situation there, Ireland needs all hands on deck now. And we want radical thinking. We want new thinking. It's a difficult situation. 
But I think that's what should have been done. OK, hold that thought for a minute, please, Ollie Wilkinson. I'm going to go to Councillor John O'Leary, who is chair of the Fianna Fáil Party in Waterford. Um, John, what do you have to say to what Ollie Wilkinson had to say there? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, what I say that Ollie has been a fantastic servant of Fianna Fáil down through the years. And I know it's a very, very difficult situation for Ollie and many of his colleagues and counterparts. But uh, look, we have to realise the position we're in and uh, what has been served up to us by the electorate. Uh, we are seen, uh, I have seen a fall, a counsellor and the chair of the Fianna Fáil party in war, but we must take cognizance of the fact at the end that um, we have to have a government that we need. Uh, Fianna Fáil is, uh, has the most uh, seats uh, in Darlene at this point in time. We have the we, we, we have leaders in Europe and the most uh, um, um, uh, candidates in Europe. We are leading the Shannon and indeed the global government for the leaders. So there is an enormous honour to lead this country. We've done it in the past. Uh, in two, 2011, uh, we were decimated. We were told we should uh, disband. We were told we should rebrand and that we should change our name. But uh, we did not go down that road. We never lost faith in our core values through hard work and dedication. We've led this country uh, for most uh, since its foundation, since the foundation of Peter Fall back in 1926. We have led this country and have been the lead party. And it, uh, there is an obligation on us now to do the same thing. Okay. Uh, you see where all these come on from. Yes. And you see where many of our members. It's a, it's a big ask out there, but we must do it in the interest of our country. OK, I want to try and give uh, as many of you as much time as possible and as even time as possible. Just try and get into a little bit of a better signal area there, uh, John. I know the, the landline isn't working and the, the signal is not great. But listen, no, it's all right, because I want to go to Anna Cowman. Uh, Anna, good morning. Morning, Damien. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Uh, Anna, just b- before I introduce you or before I ask you a question, just tell me a little bit about yourself. How long have you been in the Fianna Fáil party? Well, look, I was born in 1939 and I ended up canvassing on the crossroads in Cheap Point when I found that whole net handle in, in a two pound jamja in 1943. So I never went any other way on the Fianna Fáil, I never will. Okay. Now, what do you have to say to what Jason Murphy and John O'Leary are saying that you have to be pragmatic, there's nothing wrong effectively, we have to go, the, the world's in a bad place and we have to bury the hatchet and go into government with Fine Gael. What have you got to say to that? Well, all I'd say is uh, Fianna Fáil are going to be in a worse state over this because I do not agree with them, John. There's two civil, civil war policies, politics, politics, parties. And uh, I do not think this is going to work out. Uh, I think the whole fabric will be torn out of Fianna Fáil over this. You know, we have a lot of loyal and dedicated uh, party followers, and I don't know, I don't know how they feel about this. And just before I bring in Jason, how does this make you feel, Anna Cowman in Tremor? It's, I'm annoyed about the, about the uh, journey up with uh, Fine Gael. Yeah, how does it make you feel? How does it, like, t- tell I'm me how you feel about it. it, huh? I'm upset, upset about it, really. You know, I feel disgusted and badly let down. <sighs> Jason Murphy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm probably sighing there a little bit because I do, Anne is a good friend of mine and I do feel where she's coming from, but I have to say that, look, I believe in Fianna Fáil. We've taken tough decisions throughout our history. Uh, we had a discussion before, Damien, on, on this radio programme. We came away from the first, or sorry, the Torch in Fane in 1926. We went into the Dáil. We had, we had to sign the oath. We did that for the good, for the good of the nation at the time. We had huge leaps forward constitution. We built houses in the 30s. We, 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 we promoted neutrality policy throughout World War II. You have to believe in this party. We can do this. We can, we can go into government with Fine Gael and keep our own identity. It's very important. And I looked at the programme for government last night. I read through it and I think it's got a very, very, Fianna, a very, very firm Fianna Fáil stamp. Again, I said we weren't going to get into the programme for no, government. No, but, but like you, but you, you have to you believe. Told, you told people eight weeks ago, and people are texting in to say yeah. that you, you weren't going, you were absolutely slating Fine Gael. That's true. And I'm not, go, I'm not, I'm not going to deny that. 
But we had an election in between that. That's the fact. You know this, Damien. You're involved in politics all your life. You've watched politics. We, we, we put out our stall, as we did, to get the most seats we possibly could in that election. It didn't turn out that way. So this is a saving your ass. No, it's not a saving your ass. It's, it's a recognising reality that what happened. You've seen... Three weeks before that election, Ivan Yates was predicting 60 seats for Fianna Fáil. And maybe we bought into that. I'm going to be honest. Maybe, never believe Ivan but, Yates. Yeah, I know that. But maybe, <laughs> maybe we bought it. That was not the result. We have to deal with the result that has happened. OK, so the, the worst pragmatism thing, you're talking about. OK, I'll go, come back to you in a second. Ali Wilkinson. Hello, Ali, are you there? Yes, yes. Ali, are you living in the past... In other words, are you not accepting what Jason and and John O'Leary are saying that the reality is that there comes a time when parties have to change and that the civil war politics has to change? Or is it a hatred or a a severe dislike for Fine Gael that's stopping you from doing this? No, not at all, uh, Damien. The result of the election proved that Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael were not successful over the past four years, that combination. And my concern is not about the past. Although I have my views and I have my beliefs and I'm going to hold them. But um, you must look at the future and you must look at where Ireland is now. And we need a radical, radical move forward. I think this is not uh, radical enough. And If you look at the green situation, and I know nothing about green politics, but you had the deputy leader who challenges the leader in a short time voting against going in to talk. You've had one of the negotiators who abstained on the vote for the programme for government. And you're entitled to your vote now, and you're all getting votes. And like... People might say, Ali, that you're going to split the party. You'll burst the party by doing this, by, 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 by being in opposition to this. No, I won't burst anything. But I, I'll tell you, I have my views. And, you know, you can talk about civil war politics. Can I just point something out? A very short time ago, the Minister for Justice uh, decided that the RIC would be honoured here in this country. And we saw how the past came to light very quickly, and the whole thing was scrapped. Yeah, well, they did scrap us, yeah. Views and have their feelings. But leave that aside and look at the future, look at where we are. We need a massive, massive radical rethink, or we're going nowhere. Okay. And again, I think Fianna Fáil would want to take cognizance of the polls. The polls have been deadly accurate on the run-in to the election. They were deadly accurate. They are now showing us at around 14%. And it's obvious why. So I think all in all that notice should be taken very quickly of where we are. And okay. I think I think, I think Ollie's right. The polls are right. And, but the problem with that, Dan, is yeah, that we've brain. become irrelevant. Fianna Fáil have become irrelevant. The place for Fianna Fáil is in government and where we can put our stamp on government. Okay. That's when the polls will improve. I'm going to ask John O'Leary. John, is it just purely on the basis that, as I said to, to Jason earlier on, that you have to do this? Because if you don't do this, you will be annihilated by the electorate if you go back into an election in the next six months. And you could become what's happening to the Labour Party down at 2%. Well, Damien, I don't think the time is right now at the moment to to have a general election. But with, with all that has happened with COVID, etc., and, and who's to say that another election will throw up any different formation for government? And, and the best option open to Fianna Fáil was to uh, trying to form a government with the with the most mind, like-minded parties and 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 our, those who we have elected to do the business for us in Dalian. They, they decided that Fine Gael and the Greens would be the most amicable parties that they could work with going forward to build a government over the next four to five years that would uh, serve the people of this country uh, in, in the best possible way that it could. And, you know, um, this is this is really what this is about. This is about our country. This is about 
the, the difficult situation we're in at the moment, uh, the ability for a government, a stable government, to pass financial legislation to rebuild it, look a future for a fair recovery here in Ireland, government with a clear majority. Uh, you know, there's many, many uh, situations that need to be addressed. But I know yes. you, okay. you do not want to go into this morning to the programme for government. But really, at the end of the day, it's Fianna Fáil putting their best foot forward. We will again now have... Uh, and this is the big take for Fianna Fáil. This is the big trust for Fianna Fáil. And on Saturday week ne- next, if the Fianna Fáil people who have a vote and as they decide that they want to uh, support the programme for government, we will have uh, Michal Merton back as teacher in uh, this country. Now, that has to be that has to be a plus for all Fianna Fáil. OK, well, let me... Members who I represent yeah. in, in this city and county. OK, John, well, let me put that to Anna. Anna, it would be a plus to see Michal Martin as Taoiseach, to see a Fianna Fáil man as Taoiseach. I'm putting you, that to you, Anna, and by... You campaigning or arguing and going out and speaking out about this and yourself and Ali and others are doing it and quite right because it's a democratic party and that's what democracy it's about and it's very good to have this conversation. But I'm putting it to you, I'm putting it to you, Anna, that if you look at the alternative, it would be to go back possibly to the electorate and Fianna Fáil could suffer even more. What do you have to say to that? Well, you know, what, what, which way, whatever you look at it, Fianna Fáil will have a long, long road back over what they're doing. I'm surprised that Michal Martin is nearly 40 years in politics and go turning around to this to Fianna Fáil disgusts me. And I blame him, and I will always blame him for it. But is it just Michal right. Martin? I'll take you in a second, Jason. Is it just Michal Martin, or is it the general direction of the, the way the party's going, it's Anna? It's the last generation. But isn't she the leader? Hasn't he some say in it? Of course, yeah. Well, of course he has, yeah. And I, I'm disgusted over it, and it's going to be very, very hard I, to get Fianna Fáil. Fa- Damien, I think it's Just one second, it's Jason. Just, yeah. yeah, Anna, can I, can I ask yeah. you about y- your thoughts on Fine Gael? What's, what's your thoughts about Fine Gael? Do you really, really thoroughly dislike Fine Gael? I don't have great friends in Fine Gael, actually. I don't, but just we're not Fine Gael, we are Fianna Fáil. And that's it. Jason, yeah, yeah, look, Jason think, Anna's put it very simply. Uh, you're uh, different. We are different. And I've always had a discussion. That I always believed that Fianna Fáil was an inclusive party that brought the nation together. And parties like Fianna Gael and indeed Sinn Féin were exclusive parties that, that breed on division. I always believed that this country is more cohesive, more stronger with a Fianna Fáil government. I still believe that. And I believe we're strong enough to deliver that, even within a framework that includes Fianna Gael. But... You'll do anything for power. No, 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 not at all. But just to put things into context about Michal Martin, and I heard Anna talking about Michal Martin, and Anna's a very good friend of mine. We have to see where we came from. Back in 2011, many, many members of the media, print and otherwise, were writing off Fianna Fáil, said it was over. It was over. The project was over in 2011. Um, yeah, I, I think Michal Martin did an awful lot on his own to bring back Fianna Fáil to a point where people like me got elected in okay. 2014 and we had a successful election in 2016. Mary Butler got elected here in Watford. Uh, and we are where we are. The 2019 election changed everything. Everyone uh, would would um, would acknowledge our 2020 election, but we are where yeah, we are. Said that. Okay. Uh, John, you wanted to come in there, was it, or Ali? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you can see the work of Fianna Fáil uh, in the last government, the fact that we took a, uh, and our, our party leaders took a very strong position in the supply and confidence arrangement. We done that in the face of uh, the whole um, uh, um, difficulty that was uh, becoming an issue with Brexit, and now we have had the COVID nineteen situation. So we we have shown to be uh, Fianna Fáil members and Fianna Fáil representatives are shown to be very strong and putting uh, the country first. And the Supreme Conference arranger was done that. And just before COVID, uh, you know, the, the economy of this country was going very well. There were issues in relation to housing. There was issues in relation to health. But, um, you know, because of our supply and confidence, our support, uh, <laughs> only for COVID, we would have been in a very strong financial position. But what about, Ali? Is, is, on, sorry, John. Uh, building program and indeed improving our health service. But John, what about Michal Martin saying that he wouldn't go into power with Fine Gael? What about him saying that during the general election? 
Of course, but... Uh, but uh, what, do you, Damien, what do you mean, of course? Yeah, of course, Damien. Yeah. What I mean by that is, if, if I'm talking out for Ballydoff against Galtier, and uh, I, I'll do the best for Ballydoff against Galtier in the football match, but there comes the day then when both of us may play for the county. So we get together, we, uh, we vigorously go head-to-head and play with the county, even though we're, a, we're in opposition at club level. Yeah, but you're not going to... Like, this, this, could, this could lead you to go down to coalition with Fine Gael, potentially. Uh, like, you know, somebody said, this is like Mount Zion and Rowan Moore coming together. It's not going to work, you know? Well, it's not going to work, but listen, we have our own, and I think Jason outlined it there, we have our own core values in Fianna Fáil. We will take the, the opportunity from this to develop, to encourage. OK, and, and you've said and, that, and yes. You have his best for Fianna Fáil. Ali, Ali Wilkinson, briefly and finally, what have you got to say? Well, there's very little left to say now. The die is cast, and um, the vote will be taken all of the next few days. I'm, I just regret what has happened. Uh, I'm concerned, very concerned about the future of the country. And really, if you look at all the the speakers, Anna, my good friend Anna, and John Friend too, and uh, Jason, we're all saying the same thing about Fianna Fáil. And I can clearly see, and the two lads particularly, that they're very, very reluctant about this decision. But it's where it is, and we have to keep going. Okay. It. But I'm concerned for the future of Fianna Fáil. Anna, your final thoughts on this. Eddie and Yall has phoned in to say he'd sooner Fianna Fáil get rid of Hall Martin, the better. Anna, what's your thought on this? I'd, I'd agree with him. But anyway, what I'm going to say is we're, when we go back to the people the next one, it's going to be very, very hard to get both for Fianna Fáil because I'm not the only one that is a member of Fianna Fáil and voting against this. I know of a lot of people. So I leave it at that and we'll see what the outcome will be. Jason, 10 seconds. I suppose, look, I agree with the two speakers that are in opposition to me. I feel a bit like Michael Collins said, over to London in 1921, but look, I, I think I hope you're not going to be shot. No, I hope not as well, but <laughs> I think, look, we're at a period where we have to put the country first. I think for once in my life, I have to put Fianna Fáil second and put the country first. I think everyone has to do that. Holly, John, Anna, Jason Murphy, thanks very much for joining us, folks. Thank Damien, you. thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. And thank here's, you. A, here's a little bit of a man, just to end out this little bit. A certain man by the name of Eamon de Valera talking on his 80th birthday. Well, this memory really is uh, uh, in America itself. But I remember coming home on the boat at uh, what was then called Queenstown. My first night in Ireland, I remember both well. You have, I'm sure, um, a close memory of your days at school in Brewery, in County mm-hmm. Limerick. I have, I remember the telephone. They were very happy days? Well, like most school boy days, some happy and some not so happy. Now, I'm not going to keep him long because I know he has to go to different places. Sean Defoe, political correspondent with News Talk. Good morning. How are you keeping you well? Oh, sure, not too bad for the week. Not too bad at all. OK, we'll just do three or four minutes, a quick chat, because I know you're a busy, busy bukel. We've just had a very good discussion about Fianna Fáil, the internal machinations, two people saying that they're against voting for this deal, others, two others saying they're in favour of it. We'll talk about uh, Fine Gael and the Greens in a second. What's your gut feeling on the Fianna Fáil situation? Uh, I think that the Fianna Fáil party is, is probably going to pass this deal. There are, as you've no doubt out of the last while there are very different sides on it there's uh, quite a few people who don't want to do business with Fine Gael, don't want to go in with them and um, and you know break that tradition of history think that if two go in only one will come out and that's concerns that are also expressed in some parts of Fine Gael. but I think overall the, the mood that I'm getting certainly for the parliamentary party and also talking to councillors across the country is that while there will be uh, quite a bit of dissent it, it is probably going to pass Now the Green Party needs a two-thirds majority. Fianna Fáil only needs a uh, 1% majority. Isn't that right? Yeah, 50 plus 1. 50 plus 1. And my understanding in Waterford, for example, is 341 members, paid up members in Waterford. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the Greens, the Greens need a two-thirds majority. Talking to a, a Green number of Green people last night, I was told that it's on a knife edge at present to get that two-thirds majority. 
Absolutely, that's exactly what I'm, I'm hearing as well. It is going to be very, very tight. It's a very difficult majority to get. And uh, what people are saying to me is that they think it will be a lot tighter than even the previous vote sent to government in 2007 and also on the revised programme for government uh, later on in the lifetime of that government. There's a lot of new members of the Greens that the party is having a lot of difficulty reading as to which way they will go. The, obviously, the more vocal ones on social media have been expressing their concern, saying that the climate targets don't go far enough, that they don't trust Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil to actually deliver on them and think that if they do go in, it'll be at the end of the Green Party and nothing is actually going to get done, that there's a better deal to be done elsewhere. But then there's also a, a big rump of the party who is, uh, that is thinking, well, look, we entered into the election saying the 10 years to save the planet. Are we going to spend five years of that in opposition or should we go in and get something done? And even if we yes. don't get absolutely everything we want we can make some serious progress. The problem from the Greens is as well, and I know people that are promoting this deal are saying this within the party, if we don't go for this deal and if another election happens, the Greens will be, inverted commas, annihilated because the electorate will be very ruthless on them saying, you should have gone, we don't want an election. There's definitely some fear of that. Now, the last the poll at the weekend, the Irish Times poll actually had them up to 12%. Before. Yes. They were only within 2, 2% of Fianna Fáil um, in that particular poll, but they're very hard to read. The COVID times obviously has changed things dramatically. I don't think anyone would have predicted Fianna Fáil up 17 um, points. To, but within the Green Party, a lot of there is a sense that a lot of people voted them to go into government. They didn't vote for them to sit in the sidelines. They voted for them to get climate action done. And in some sense, there's a certain type of voter that said, well, you'll put manners on Fine Gael or Fianna Fáil if you're in government with them, that you will be able to steer them more towards the green agenda. And you do see a lot of that reflected in the programme for government. Almost every page has some reference to the climate, some reference to the green agenda. Every single part of it is framed in that sort of context to be attractive to green voters. So there is the fear of a a general election. But again, there's others in the Green Party say, well, we don't necessarily have to have a second general election if for example, this deal fails. Uh, could we see a situation where Fianna Fáil may talk to Sinn Féin and we could form an alternative government that way and, and get more in a programme for government? So there is yeah. um, some of those who are opposed to the deal saying that you know a general election isn't the only option, even if it is a risk of voting this down. Eamon O'Quee for Taoiseach. There you go. Finally, uh, it, might be an in, it might be in Fine Gael's interest to go to the electorate in the next three or four months. They're the ones that would benefit amazingly for what happened in the last three to four months. Well, if you were to take the, the COVID bounce that they have had, you, you would think so. Certainly, I think they would do better than they did the last time around. Um, Leo Varadkar, I know, quipped last night after winning the UN Security Council seat that it was nice to win one election this year. But there's some part in his party who are thinking about perhaps the second one. The more the more realistic people in the party say, look, that's not going to be reflective over a three-week, one-month-long campaign. Every single thing we've done during the COVID crisis we put under the microscope. And it, it might not. And obviously, how would you do an election in... Uh, in COVID times. I think Fine Gael are going to pass this deal. They have a very different structure with the, the delegate nature of it. 50% of the vote is coming from the parliamentary party, another 10% from the National Executive Council. So there you are almost already um, it, with the majority yes. both of those have the 50% needed to pass it. So um, that's, I think they would be the least fearing of a second election Fianna Fáil, definitely more so afraid of going back to the electorate and Micheál Martin um, scared of uh, you know losing his one chance of, of what possibly could be his one chance of becoming Taoiseach. Sean Defoe as ever, thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean Defoe there. Political correspondent with News Talk on the uh, machinations that's going on behind the scenes. Uh, Stay with us. We want to know, are you looking at flying abroad? Would you go to an airport? Would you get on a plane? We're going to be talking about that next. And we have a lot of your texts and comments to to take on board. 83 9375 Now, I'm going to talk to Kevin from Cork Airport in a second. Firstly, get your texts and calls coming in if you're looking at flying abroad and also if you have any issues relating to the matters we've discussed already this morning. Fianna Fáil are finished if they join up. Totally agree with Anna, said a texter. Another texter saying, we have to go into government or we're going to be finished. So uh, people saying the complete opposite. Uh, Kevin Cullinan, good morning. Morning, Damien. Thanks very much for joining us. Head of Communications at Cork Airport. We knew you're the second busiest international airport. Now, you've implemented a number of health and hygiene measures in place, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Firstly, some news just in in the last while, I suppose, that families hoping to jet off on sun holidays after lockdown. Um, A fresh blow, you could say. It's emerged travel restrictions for Irish airports will be extended for another three weeks. Uh, What do we know about this, Kevin? 
Well, the Irish government advice throughout the pandemic has been that people should not be travelling unless it's been absolutely essential. So over the last three months or so, the only passengers that we've seen going through our airports have been those that are either repatriating to their own countries or Irish, Irish people coming back home. And in the first few weeks, that was mainly uh, people coming back to, to heed Ireland's call to join the frontline emergency service personnel yes. in, in our health service. So people haven't yet been travelling for, for leisure or holiday purposes because the government advice is not to do so. And the second reason has been that there is a mandatory 14-day self-isolation quarantine required when you come back. So even if you could fly, um, the, the restriction at the moment is that you fill out a passenger locator form on your arrival back into any Irish airport or port saying where you're going to be staying for the next 14 days as you self-isolate. So those two factors really have been the biggest two barriers to people getting back up and flying, yeah. even though a lot of the airlines have been advertising that they're they're available and will be flying from the 1st of July. We're still waiting for those two restrictions to be lifted by the government. Now, you've put in place a lot of safety measures and fair play to you. It's only right that you do it, but you've, you've really done it from what I can see from the different outlines on the uh, information that you've sent to us. Uh, can you go through them uh, fairly briefly, if you wouldn't mind, Kevin? I suppose the message you're, you're getting out there is that it is safe to travel. Is that what you're saying? It's, it will be very safe to travel and no, no different to people going, doing their weekly shopping over the last number of weeks. People will get used to the same social distancing measures they've seen in their local supermarket. I suppose the main difference when people will be flying again is that passengers are being strongly recommended to wear, wear face masks or face coverings, not just when they're flying, but from the moment they enter the terminal uh, say at Cork Airport until they reach their final destination. And there's a whole series of other measures. People are very familiar now with these plexiglass screens in their supermarket at the at the tills. You'll see them again at check-in counters, at, at passport control, at where you get your boarding pass checked and so forth. And obviously multiple sanitization stations and freestanding wall, free wall-mounted uh, units everywhere. Uh, and obviously we've changed the passenger flow through the airport to, to minimize the physical uh, to maximise the physical distance between passengers uh, and obviously to, to minimise dwell times and, and queuing in certain hot spots. But it's the same friendly service personnel will be there. It's just that in a lot of instances, they'll be behind a face mask or face covering or maybe even a face visor themselves as you go through the passenger security screening area. I know a lot of the airlines, in particular Ryanair, are promoting these deals at the at, at the minute. Um What's the bookings like, do you know, for, we'd say, July? Because the self-isolation thing seems to be extended till July the 9th. So uh, any indications at this stage in terms of how things are going to look for July and August, Kevin? I, I think bookings for July um, are, are soft at the moment because people are waiting to see how soon the government and the Department of Health will lift these restrictions on particularly the 14-day uh, self-isolation and quarantine measure. Um Obviously, some airlines are starting back up, but they expect the initial numbers of passengers on board to be quite weak. Air France will start back to Paris on the 1st of July. Uh, Ryanair are ramping up their operation for July and August. Uh, we have Swiss starting back from Cork to, to Zurich, and people will have seen where Aer Lingus Regional, flying mainly to UK regional cities, uh, have put flights back on sale for the 1st of August. So the airlines are aware that there is pent-up demand, I suppose, after the lockdown people are saying, if it's safe to do so, I, I want to get a break this year, I want to get away. Uh, and I think as soon as the government makes a decision, which looks like it's going to be in the, the next week or so, um, we hopefully will have passengers flying back um, from the Dacia through Cork Airport, you know, from the second half of July into August and hopefully beyond. Yeah, the 14-day extension of quarantine at the minute, again, that's going to be problematic for some people because nobody's going to have, let's say, a month's holidays. You might go away for 10 days and then isolating. And then there's the problem, I suppose, as well, Kevin. A text in, a friend of mine was home from Amsterdam this weekend and has gone back. He didn't isolate for 14 days. So it's hard to really keep a, a tab on all this, I suppose, isn't it? Yes, and I suppose that's why the government brought in the mandatory filling out of those passenger locator forms, which now have to be handed in to the immigration officers at passport control in any Irish port or airport. Um, so people have to say where they're going to be for the, the following 14 days. There are some people that, that are exempt from that, particularly if, they, if they're working in the, the travel industry, uh, airline pilots and crew and so forth. 
Um, but in the main, it, it, it just doesn't make travel to, to a sun destination conducive at the moment. Um, but there are, I suppose, we're, we're getting indications um, by the day that the government is seriously looking at this. And as as this famous R rate uh, stays below one uh, and community transmission of the disease is being suppressed, uh, it does give some hopes for optimism uh, coming into, you know, to the remaining latter end of the summer and hopefully we can still save the, the summer holiday for this year. Uh, Kevin Cullinan, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Always a pleasure, Damien. Good to talk to you. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin Cullinan, their Head of Communications at Cork Airport. Uh, <laughs> Paul has texted in, Cork has stopped us getting university status 24-7 and now with Micheál Martin at the helm, I fear for this county. Uh, we've no hopes as another texter uh, with a huge Cork presence. Now we want to see Cork Airport being successful and we want to see Waterford Airport being successful because a few people have texted in regarding the debate we had about Fianna Fáil. Uh, the major issues is no 24-7, no runway, North Quays not, is not, not in the programme for government. Um, Sinn Féin should have been is what the people voted for says Paddy and a number of uh, Sinn Féin supporters or people saying that Sinn Féin should be spoken to and should be in the government party negotiations now keep your texts and comments coming in 083 333 975